Amen. It's great to see you. Hey, go ahead and grab your Bible. Uh, you can turn to the book of Psalms. We're going to end up at Psalm 41 uh, today. And as Keith noted, I think what he was trying to say um, was that we're going to enter into a, yes, a better sermon series. We're always getting better, right? I always say it. Uh, in Christ, the best is yet to come. Always yet to come. Even after we pass from this life, the best is yet to come. So today we find ourselves on Memorial Day weekend, and this reminds us, among many things, Memorial Day reminds us that we live in a fallen world. Think about it. One of the reasons I believe the Bible is because it makes sense of everything that happens in our world. It's the place that I find truth that makes sense with all of the evil that we see in the world. We, we, we remember, we honor those who have died in conflict between nations and wars. And there's coming a day when wars will cease to, to, to exist. There won't be people dying in wars anymore. And this is the day that we long for. We sang Martin Luther's words, his, his lyrics from 1526. It seemed that he had a greater awareness of this evil that is present in the world than, than so many of us do in our day today. But so many who've died in conflicts, nation against nation. Today we're going to talk about the root cause of this discord. We all know that it's disharmony within. It's sin. The Bible tells us this is why. We don't have to wonder or guess. Is it an educational problem? Is it a financial problem? Is it what, what is, we, we're all trying to figure out what it is, we all know at the heart of it, it's, it's within us. Memorial Day is, of course, also a reminder uh, for, of those who paid the ultimate price for our, our, our freedom today. And it begs the question, what might I be willing to die for? For those who've literally died. If on Veterans Day we thank those who serve and have served, on Memorial Day we can't thank those who have passed away. We can pray as we have today for their families and and yet there are those who paid the ultimate price. And maybe the, the better question, what is it that I'm willing to die for every day in order to live for the Lord Jesus Christ? We're going to talk about that today. As we turn to Psalm 41, we're going to see that, that harmony in our lives is happiness. Or we're going to find that, that discord is destructive and that unity is, is healing now, you may not know this, that, that um, while I set this up, you're turning to Psalm 41. I want, to, I want you to have that open in front of you for all of us today. You may not know that the Psalms, we're, we're ending a series of messages as noted. The Psalms are actually five different books um, within the one we call the Psalms. Verse 41 that we'll look at today ends the first book uh, of the book of Psalms, of the five. Some think that reflects or, or harkens back to the five books of the Torah, that now we have the word of God that we sing, that we proclaim to him. It was an ancient, as you know, songbook for the Israelites. And we still draw from it. So raw, so real is the book of Psalms. It's real life, we've said. But if the, the, if the first book had a theme, and I want to place always in context what we're preaching and teaching, if the first book had a theme, it would be how to be happy. How to, be, how to be blessed. And who doesn't want to live a happy life? But today you're going to see, as often as the case, Jesus, in fact, teaches us this. The way to be happy is not what we anticipate. And it's not what most people believe in our culture. Maybe even most Christian people. And today you're going to see a surprising uh, answer to the question, how can I live a happy life? And, and I want to challenge us all to think deeply about what the Lord presents to us here in his, in his word. So the first thing I want you to see is, is, is that happiness or, or harmony is happiness. We'll define the terms along the way. The first three verses here in chapter 41 are dripping with, with happiness. The first word in the book of Psalms, you might, might remember, is blessed. Blessed are those who do not you know, walk in the way of wicked or stand with the sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but instead delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night, always thinking about the commands, the truth of God's word. That's where the psalm begins. And then this is where the first 
book ends. The same word. Look at this. And you're going to see a surprising source of happiness. You're already there. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. Now in the ESV there's an exclamation point. Because the word blessed there is an, it's an interjection. It's, a, it's a, an ex- exclamation. As, as, as if to say, look how surprising this is. In our context, let's, let's be honest. How happy is the one who considers the poor? I'm like, wait, really? Like, what does this have to do with my life? And look at this. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. This sounds like a strange place to find happiness. This word poor uh, here in the ESV might be better translated, I think, in the Hebrew as weak or helpless. It's a broader term. Yes, it includes the poor. But notice he says consider. Now, this is an important Hebrew word as well. See, often time and distance and space and language cause us to read the Psalms or read the ancient scriptures and say, I don't really see how this connects. Watch how it does, in fact, always connect. This word consider means to to have sustained reflection upon. And I want you to think, we're going to be here for a half an hour or so, and I want you to really consider with me to think deeply about the poor in this first point. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this first point that harmony is happiness and how we can all be happier you say what does this have to do with happiness well unless you're poor it would have a lot to do with your happiness and well-being right but think about it considering the poor okay those who are powerless or weak I want you to think about those who are weak or powerless in your sphere of influence I'm going to talk about how we can serve the poor and how we do as a church family, but I want you to think about those in your life. We're going to apply this right away. Who in your relationships, maybe in your family, you know, that person is a bit weaker than the rest of us for some reason. Maybe it's in the workplace. It, maybe it's at school. I know our kids are out of school now, but maybe it's someone who, wow, they seem powerless. They seem to be in need. Think about someone in your own family, maybe extended family, who that lives near you that might be in need, your sphere of influence. But think about this, considering the poor, caring for the weak, raising up the helpless is a certain action to eliminate the opposite of harmony, which is disharmony, discord. It's it's to, to say, I'm going to enter into where I see discord, disharmony, inequality, disunity, and we raise others up and it eliminates the discord that we see so often in relationships, in families. And in our community and our our nation. Because when those who are in power have resource, we all have resource to care for others in our lives, we leverage that power to raise them up. This is precisely what Jesus talked about and what it's like to live in the kingdom. See, without disparities and inequalities, there is no need for discord, right? Because everyone is equal at the foot of the cross. Everyone has all they need. And God is the one who has power. And you say, well, Jeb, that sounds a lot like heaven. Yes. Yet God, look at this. God says, you want to be blessed? Happy? Truly happy. Live this way now. And as people of the kingdom, this is the way that we live. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Different gifts, different roles that we play. All created in the image of God. And if if there's a sure sign that we are saved by the grace of God, it would be this. Jesus said it himself. He said, when when I was in prison, you cared for me. When when, when I was in need, you you gave me something to eat. When when I was hungry, you you fed me. He's saying, and then, then the question is asked in Matthew 25. When did we see you? In the, when do we see you in prison? When do we see you hungry? Or, he said, when you've done it unto the least of these. Listen to this. Jesus so identifies with the poor that he says, when you've done it unto them, you've done it unto me. And any of us who've gone among the poor and those who are in need, there's a tangible presence of the Lord. So to consider the poor is to think deeply about what keeps them down. To consider the poor means what can we learn from them? It has a double meaning here. How is it that we can be more like Jesus? And I want to ask you, who are you serving? Here's the question. Who are you serving these days who cannot reciprocate to you at all? Who are you serving? 
And one way you can do that is to care for, for little ones, right? Or care for, I'm looking at many of you who serve uh, those who are in home. Some are watching me right now who can't be here today, who long to be here. Those who are ill, you go to the hospital. You, you pray for those. Our deacons go and serve. And all members, we're all ministers. Who are you serving that, that gives nothing back to you at all? Some of you might be serving among our preschoolers or our youngest ones. Now, they're cute, but they don't, do, they don't give anything back to you. Unless it's something that needs to be changed. But that's also part of, of serving them as well, right? There's all kinds of ways. But that's a key question. And if you can't quickly answer that question, friends, I want this sermon to challenge you. Because a sure sign that you've been saved by grace is that you're caring for those who can do nothing for you in return. Not the law of reciprocity. Because that's where most of our relationships go and that's where the discord comes. You have more than me. I want more than you. I need who has power. And this is what creates such disharmony in our world. We can make a difference, right? I want to spend a moment here just to talk about the great work that our church is doing and to challenge you, okay? Um, Keith noted, Rodney noted. I mean, we've got this amazing um, annual report. You can grab one, you're gonna get one in the mail, but this is incredible, gang. I, I, show, I told our team, you've got some summer reading now um, because there's so much. And read every, every word in this. It's amazing. My heart was filled with gratitude. When I, when I looked over this, and I'm going to continue to rejoice in all that God has done through our church. And if you're a guest here, you can come to Discover next week again, but you, you need to grab one. Because friends, I'm telling you, the, church, the impact that our church is having in the world is incredible. Many of you are serving the poor in Vickery, uh, literally in, in, at Cornerstone in South Dallas or Brother Bill's or Bachman Lake or Buckner, through our ministries there, you are serving. In fact, uh, some of you are are mentoring students. We'll have the opportunity to do so as we kick off a new school year. Uh, You've done as I've done, mentor students at Jack Lowe Elementary and encourage the teachers there. We have so many opportunities to care for the immigrants and for people who've sought political asylum, refugees, literally, instead of raging at the television and wondering if our politicians will ever get it together, you can actually do something. And that's what we're doing. In fact, many are going to South Texas, to the border, to care for those who are in need and to share the gospel because that's the way of Jesus. And as we go to places like Guatemala or the Caribbean Basin, we, we, we share the, the gospel with people in need. One of our pastors there, in fact, um, was talking with our missions committee and the Caribbean Basin there, and, he, and they were asking, what can we do for you? What is your greatest need? And listen, the pastor said, we need food for our families, literally for my family. And we're able to, to help them. Some of you know uh, Dan Young and Ben Jones. I talked to Dan just yesterday. But Dan Young and Ben Jones have been taking furniture uh, to those in need over in Vickery. And they need more hands. They need more help. You can contact our mission office. You can contact our offices with any of this that I'm talking about. If you want to say, I need to do more to care for the poor because we have so many opportunities. But I want to say this, if you give to our church family, if you give with with great generosity, you are indeed impacting the poor. So much of this annual report has to do with what we're doing to care for those who do not have much. And I don't know when you first showed up here at Park City's Baptist Church. But if you have recently showed up or maybe years ago you came here, you don't have to look for long to see where we're located, what God has resourced us with, the beauty of this place, and consider this. To whom much is given, much is required. And this is how we're going to be the church that Jesus envisioned us to be. In a major way, that is what we're doing here. Our missions uh, committee... Uh, recently um, has made a promise to our men of Nehemiah down in South Dallas to say we're going to offer seed money that's going to help build your new facilities to get more men off the streets, out of addiction, out of prison, back on their feet. And that ministry is transforming lives. Many of you men in particular are involved in that ministry. It is incredible. 
You have a part in that through your giving. I was at the Texas Baptist Men's Headquarters a week ago with uh, David Hardage and, and taking a tour of all that they're doing. And you know that these are the first to respond when disasters come, when a tornado hits or something takes place, not just in Texas, but literally across our nation around the world. And when you see them on the news, you can say, I'm a part of that. Those are our guys. Those are our brothers and sisters who are serving. It's through your giving. You're allowing the Lord to allow us to be a part of what he's doing in the world. This is what it means. Here's the point. This is what it means to think deeply about, to consider the poor. What keeps them down? What can we do to help raise them up? And that's what we do. That's what our missions committee is all about and taking our money and your giving, your generous giving and say, let's use it to leverage it for kingdom purposes. Because Jesus did the same for us. He moved into our neighborhood, into our sinless, helpless state. He came from the very top, Paul says in in Philippians 2, all the way down to where we are. Because this is the way of Jesus. See, discord happens. It often happens because we consider that others have less than we have, but we think, well, they probably deserve less than we have. I've worked hard for what I have, and I deserve more. It's often about our pride and power, isn't it? That's often the question, who holds the power? Which is why he says this is what creates the day of trouble. See, many of our troubled days are days of our own making. We're anxious about what we have or don't have. We get nervous or stressed out because we want to have more. We want to be sure that we have enough, don't we? But friends, when we think about poverty, oftentimes we think in terms of scarcity. Again, consider, think deeply about this with me. We often think about scarcity. It's not ultimately about scarcity. Because there's plenty to go around, particularly in a church and in the body of Christ and in our communities. It's a function of generosity, not scarcity. And those of us who have much, to whom much is required. And and so I'm so grateful. I'm challenging us, yes, but I'm so thankful for the generosity of our church. And as your pastor, I am so humbled by the way that God is using us all together. And it takes all of us. I say it often, if you have a little, give a little. If you have some, give some. If you have a lot, give a lot. And every one of us together, we know that we can make a difference, right? But think about in your own life again, the conflicts that you face. Often those are having to do with who has what. And often it is leveraging power in some way. You know this happens. If you're married, who, wait, who's got an upper hand here? And for those of you who have children, children come along, there is a power grab right away. And as we raise kids, who's in charge here? Who's running the show? Now with parents, clearly the parents are running the show. But I say all this because so often when we think about the quarrels that we have and the trouble we have, listen to James chapter four, verse one, where he talks about this. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? He answers the question. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? See, again, it starts within. You're, you desire what you do not have, so you murder. And Jesus taught us there's many ways to murder another. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. We quarrel because we want what we do not have. And this happens in relationships. And he's basically saying, why don't you, you're not just going to ask God for it. Because you know if you do, he's likely going to tell you, you don't need that. You need to humble yourself, you see. And so look at verse two. The Lord protects him and keeps him alive. He is called blessed. There it is, he's happy in the land. You did not give him up to the will of his enemies. Happy is the person who knows he's protected by God. This is a reference to um, being blessed in the land is the covenantal promise made to, uh, made to Abraham. It's a promise to have a safe and, and to grow and to prosper in a place where you have security and everyone is loving one another. So you have a safe and affirming community when people live like this, right? Look at verse three. 
The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. Okay, wow. In his illness, you restore him to full health. David says, when you care for others, if this is the kind of community you live in, you're likely going to be cared for as well. This disharmony that comes through, our, through, through people who oppose us and even internal disharmony, even physical, right? Harmony comes. We, we can do simple things to contribute to harmony in the lives of people around us. So I want you to think about that. You know, I'll, I'll let you choose, right? Uh, I don't know if you're like Stacy and I. You choose the restaurant we'll go out. No, you choose. No, you choose. Um, you know, I don't know if you all do that or maybe, no, you choose what we're gonna do today. You choose the movie we're gonna watch. How about this? Um, no, you go in front of me here as I'm driving around in Dallas. Think about this. Why don't you take... Wait, I got here, we're sharing the load. The lane has, has now come to one. And, uh, it's my turn. How about if we let others go in front of us? Something as simple, you, you step in. You merge into my lane without me getting angry. Why is it that we, no, what is that? James says, well, it's within you. You've got to have the upper hand. It's about, again, power. What about, uh, wow, how about, I know there's a line forming here. How about you go in front of me? How about as something as simple, how about I open the door with a smile and you come on in? Again, what if everyone lived that way? And again, we, we said, that'd be heaven, wouldn't it? And the Lord said, you want to be happy? Live that way now. Truly, you want to be blessed? Live that way now. Because what happens when we don't live this way is discord. It's disharmony, right? It's the opposite. So if harmony is happiness, then discord is destructive. Again, David knows this destruction begins within him. Look at verse four. As for me, I said, oh Lord, be gracious to me. He's saying, I need your grace in my life for I have sinned against you. Now, David moves, watch this. He moves from a broader theological, even sociological view of how the world could actually look if we live this way. And he comes right down to very personal, down-to-earth life. He looks at his everyday struggle. As we move into this psalm, this is interesting. It seems that David himself is sick. David himself is ill, but something rather serious. And it was common to believe that illness was a direct result of disharmony with God, Right? Now, we often toss that out. And we say, well, that's bad theology. However, pause for a moment and think about this. Modern science is unearthing all kinds of connections to our anxiety, worry, anger, bad behavior to our physical health. We're holistic people. We've talked about that a lot in recent days. In fact, we even laugh about someone being hangry some of you are hangry. Well, you just need something to eat. As if my nutritional intake will determine how loving and kind I am. But we are holistic people. And so our physical health is connected to our mental health, our spiritual health. In fact, fun fact, um, Pew Research, the Mayo Clinic and others have shown that religious people are actually happier than non-religious people. And our health outcomes and longevity in life are greater and better than those who are not religious and a, a large bulk of those Christian people. But regardless of whether our physical health is a result of our sinful lifestyle, which can be the case or not, David knows where we go for healing. Look at verse five. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? Now look at this. Here's, here's a, something we don't think often about. One thing that brings about discord in our lives is apathy. They don't care whether he lives or dies. And this question is actually a reference to, to his inheritance, dying without an heir. And the question here is, 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 you can see that David adding shame to his illness. Often, often shame does come along with our illness and, and sickness. It's why we're slow to share our needs with other people. It's like we're, we're, we're shamed about it. Shame can often accompany personal distress. It's why some of us maybe don't share or don't even, I'm not going to put my name on a prayer list. I don't want people talking about me or I don't. Somehow we connect that with shame when we should have others praying for us, praying over us. 
This verse reveals something that we don't often associate with discord. It's apathy. Any way you slice it, apathy says, I don't care. Just, I don't care. This is largely what our discussions, think about it, are around disharmony and inequality in the world. I care about racism, but I don't really do anything about it. I care about the poor. I don't really do anything. That's apathy, you see. And what we see here are a group of people who say, well, you know, whether David dies or not, in fact, it might be good for us, his enemies, that he die. What will you do this week to change that? What are you apathetic about? Maybe it's a relationship in your life. Maybe it's a, a family member, someone close to you. Where has apathy raised its ugly head in your life? Look at verse 6. When one comes to see me, he utters empty words. Empty words are saying something but not really believing it. While his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. Now this one's clear. One of the things that contribute to discord is our words. Our words, and we know this. We can either heighten or lessen the harmony with others in our lives by the things we say. David feels betrayed by someone close to him. Think about that. Look at verse seven, all who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. Now clearly gossip creates discord in our lives. Negative words are, are, are all about you know, putting others down. My dad used to say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. I grew up in a, in a family like that. You know, one of the greatest affirmations you can bring to another person and think, if you know, think about this, if you know someone like this, is to say, I've never heard them say an unkind word about anyone. Could it be said about us, about you? Because in our day, isn't it true? Don't, we th don't I have to say what I don't like about someone? Don't I have to say something about a group I don't agree with? Isn't that the world we kind of live in? No, you don't have to. We can actually be agents of grace and love. Look at verse eight. They say, a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Now this has to do with failing to keep confidences. This too sows discord. David is sick, but this is what we call triangulation. We talk about this on our staff team, our kind of staff credo. I shared this with a group of new deacons in an orientation uh, this past week and, and it's this I will never talk about you until I've talked to you then only for you and never against you friends if we all live that way particularly the body of Christ where are you prone to be negative about certain people or whom might you be negative about maybe they're in your own life are you prone to negative talk we often say it, how would I know? Ask people who know you well. Ask people that you can trust. Sometimes this gossip comes about, you know, it's the, it's the old joke um, that the Baptist, you know, prayer request is a form of gossip. Did you know? But friends, not here. Prayer is our first response. We want to pray for one another. So I challenge you. Here's a challenge for you this week. I'm, I'm taking, taking myself to task here. Only kind words. All week long. Every word. Kind words. Can you do it? Bertrand Russell said this. No one gossips about people's secret virtues. Let's do that this week. Let, let's... Let's talk, let's be openly affirming and positive about other people in our lives when they're not around. I got a text this week from one of our leaders in our church. I get one almost every week from this guy. Dear friend, and he is just encouraging me early in the morning. And I mean, I looked at it on the run, but it just lifted me up, right? And, and isn't it interesting when someone does that, it comes right at the time when you need it the most. Why is that? Spirit's prompting, and maybe we just need that most of the time. 
And we can all do that for another. This should be normal in the church. It should be normal in a Christian home with roommates and siblings and friends. Look at verse 9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Someone close to David who ate bread with him. This is is reminding us that the closest ones to us can hurt us the most. The ones who are right close to us. Prolific writer um, Ambrose Bierce who talked a lot about you know, being angry and it's at times when we're angry when we say the things that hurt the most. She wrote this. Speak when you're angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. This week, remember these words from the book of James again. Listen to this. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, sustaining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. How much do we see this in our culture today? For every kind of beast and bird and reptile, sea creature has been tamed, has has been tamed, uh, that can be tamed, has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, These things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening fresh water and salt water? That which brings life and that which brings no life. Harmony is happiness, but selfish, apathy, negative words, gossip bring discord. And discord is destructive. And we'll close with this. Unity is healing. So David's not well, but he's happy in the Lord. Look at verse 10. But you, O Lord, be gracious. There it is again. I need your grace. Raise me up that I may repay them. Now, he's not coming at vengeance with them. What he's talking about here, he's really going to state his innocence. He wants to argue his innocence, as we'll see. By this, I know that you delight in me. My enemy will not shout in triumph over me. He says, they, they will not win. Look at verse 12. But you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Again, he's not boasting in his integrity. He says, you have held me up. You have given me integrity. Now think about this. Now we're getting to the heart of the matter. Unity starts inside of us. Integrity is to be integrated, right? It's to be whole. What you believe, what you think in your heart is what you say with your mouth and you do what you say you're going to do and you bring uh, harmony and love to people around you. When you do that, when you keep a confidence, when you do not gossip, when you encourage others, when you affirm others, discord does not stand a chance. And I'm so grateful for the unity that the Lord has brought to our church in these beautiful and wonderful days. David is actually protesting his innocence here. But you can only do that if you live a life of integrity, right? But what we see can happen oftentimes when we're facing discord or at odds with people, we defend ourselves. Why do we defend ourselves? Because most of the time we're guilty, that's why. But we can do this if we live lives of integrity. Look at verse 13. He's gonna close again. Blessed, happy, How about this? Happiness is the Lord, is essentially what he's saying. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed is the Lord. Happiness is found in him. Now, I want you to look back over this psalm, and I want you to see what we've seen throughout this series of messages. And what we see throughout the Bible. This psalm is not ultimately about David, It's about someone else. This Bible, uh, this Bible, yes, this psalm points us to Jesus. Look over it again. Jesus considered the poor. Again, from the very top, he came all the way down into our poverty. And he said, blessed, happy are those who know they're poor in spirit, who are humble and know they need forgiveness. He became poor for us. 
He cried out on our behalf from the cross. He was given over to his enemies. He took on our illness. He took on our sickness unto death, though he never sinned. He was slandered and betrayed by others, even those closest to him who took bread with him and who whispered his name betrayed him. Jesus was the one who fulfills all that we desperately need and we follow him because he alone has come and triumphed over our enemies. It's his heel of prophecy way back in Genesis 3 that has crushed the enemy under his feet as he went to the cross and he paid the price for us. They cannot shout victory over him because he has triumphed over death and he allows us to join him in procession of those who follow him in resurrection and who live this life today and live like this in the here and now. God alone has brought harmony into our hearts. It's what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 14, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And the context of Ephesians 2 here is not only has he made us right with God, he's made us right with others. And the context is between people who are ethnically, religiously, politically, who are not alike. And he's broken down the wall so that we can all come together and worship the Lord. I praise him for the growing diversity in our church family. See, Jesus showed us the way with a different kind of power, a different kind of love. It's enemy love and it's self-sacrifice. What does this look like? It looks like grace. It looks like celebrating the other. It looks like when one wins, we all win. When the young people win, we all win. When, When the older folks win, the younger celebrate. We celebrate all that's happening in the church family because we're all in it together. And so what we want to do as we close our time together is proclaim it together. Here's the beauty of song as Stephen comes up to lead us. The beauty of singing is what we've talked about today. It's harmony. It's different voices, multiple voices singing together. Same words, same harmonies or same melody. But listen, as we sing, we're going to proclaim church arise. Let's be this church and say yes to all that we've heard today. Harmony is happiness. Discord is destructive. But unity brings healing to us all.